Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. The ring of integers in a number field is a Dedekind domain, which means in particular that non-zero ideals can be uniquely factored into prime ideals. In this video, I want to talk about the class group, which in a sense measures how far ideals are from being principal ideals. And as such, that means that study of the class group is intimately connected with trying to extend arguments where you use prime factorization for integers to the case of uh, algebraic number fields. Okay, so let's just see what our setup is. Uh, so let k be our number field. Okay, so that just means some finite uh, field extension of the uh, rational uh, number field. And OK is going to be the ring of integers inside that K. Okay. So the first theorem that I've already mentioned here is that OK is a Dedekind domain. So every uh, non-zero ideal I here can be uniquely factored into primes. Okay. So you might not necessarily have prime factorization of elements into uh, uh, primes, but on the level of ideals you can. Unfortunately, the proof is too long to contain here. It will take uh, several uh, videos to do that. So I'll leave that for another day. Uh, let me move on to defining what the class group is, which is quite interesting and allows us to use this theorem quite efficiently. Okay, so my starting point is I'm going to introduce this set here, which is this calligraphic I subscript K. And it's just going to be the set of all fractional ideals. All the uh, ideals I inside K, in other words, all OK submodules of K which are contained in some principal fractional idea. Okay, and the proposition here is that this uh, set of fractional ideals, this uh, script IK, is actually a group when you endow it with um, a multiplication which is given by a product of ideals. Okay, so let's just see uh, firstly what this means, okay, examine what this means, and also show why it's true. Okay, so suppose you have two uh, fractional ideals, IJ inside here, as I said, to be fractional means that they have to be contained inside a principal fractional ideal. So it's all OK multiples of some rational, um, so some non-zero element of K, F. And uh, so I is contained in some principal fractional ideal like this, and J is contained in some principal fractional ideal like this. So remember what this is. This is essentially just shorthand for all the multiples of F by some uh, uh, integer, OK? OK. So what's ij? So I claim that you can take the product of these two, that's the uh, product of ideals, okay, and that's going to be another fractional ideal. So what does this uh, mean? So recall that just means you look at all possible products, one from i and j, and from all these products you add, up, uh, add them up, so it's closed under addition, okay, so it's sums of products, uh, where the products come one from i, one factor from i, and one from j. Okay, so if you take one particular uh, product, okay, you'll have uh, something in here, which in particular is a multiple of f, times something in here, which is a multiple of g. So in particular, that product will be a multiple of fg. And if you sum up a finite number of them, you'll still get a multiple of fg. So that means that this is contained inside the principal fractional ideal that's generated by fg. And in particular, this uh, is indeed a fractional ideal. Okay, so you can take this uh, product of ideals, if you multiply two fractional ideals, you get a fractional ideal. So this is something that is a, a, a fractional ideal. Okay, so um, what do we want? We want this to be a group. So let's just see what the identity element is in here. The identity element is just going to be um, the fractional ideal, which is just OK itself. Because you, if you multiply OK with some ideal here, so if I was OK instead, of course, you have the 1 in there, so you'll get all of J. Um, but since this is an OK uh, module, OK, it's closed under scalar multiplication by OK, you don't get anything more than J here. So multiplication by OK doesn't change anything, so it's the identity in this group. The last thing is the um, inverse. And of course, the inverse should be the inverse uh, fractional ideal. So you have to check that the inverse is indeed a fractional ideal. So let's look at um, I inverse. Okay, and I claim that if you pick any non-zero element h inside here, of course you can look at h inverse and the uh, principal fractional ideal generated by that. I claim that, that completely contains this i inverse. Okay, so this i inverse is indeed a fractional ideal. And why is that true? It's quite easy to see. So what does it mean to be inside this i inverse? That means that if you multiply it with any element inside i, you stay inside the uh, ring of integers OK. 
But H is inside I, so if you multiply it uh, with anything inside H, okay, it will be inside, um, uh, if you multiply with anything inside H, okay, it will be inside um, uh, I, uh, inside OK rather. So that means that it is actually inside the inverse of uh, the principal ideal generated by H, which is just the, um, the principal ideal generated by H inverse. Okay, so that's the proof for that fact. Okay, so lovely. We have a group structure, and we're going to use this group structure to try to understand the arithmetic of this ring of integers. Okay, so now we come to the main definition here. This is the definition of the class group. So what is the class group of this ring of integers? Okay, you can define this more generally. Um, uh, in other contexts, but we'll just do it in this particular case here for this dedicated domain. Okay, the class group of OK is just going to be you take this group here of uh, fractional ideals with a product of ideals as its multiplication, and you're going to factor out by a subgroup. What's that subgroup? That's a subgroup of principal fractional I uh, ideals. Okay, so uh, subgroups of things like this, uh, fractional ideals like this. Okay, so you know that this is a subgroup because the product of these two is still principal. And the inverse of, for example, the fractional ideal generated by H is just a fractional ideal generated by H inverse. Okay, so that is a subgroup. And there you have it. That is your um, uh, class group. Okay, great. So that at the moment, that's just a definition. And the remark is the following. Um, this is basically telling you how far ideals are away from being principal. Okay, that's why you look at this quotient. Okay, so you just factor it out by all the principal ideals, and then this is a measure of that. Okay, so in particular, uh, suppose the class group is just uh, trivial, so it's just equal to the identity. It's got one element in there that tells you that every fractional ideal is going to be uh, principal, and in particular, every ideal is principal. Okay, so in that case, there, if the class group is trivial, then OK is actually a unique factorization domain. So this theorem, okay, where you have unique factorization into prime ideals, okay, for any uh, ideal. Uh, it tells you that it's now going to give you unique factorization of elements into elements, okay? And that's because um, all your ideals are actually um, a principle, okay? So this is uh, one thing that's very good to know. This is a very important condition, okay? And more generally, you're basically saying that uh, the smaller this group is, it's kind of saying the smaller this group is, the closer it is that this ring of integers, okay, is to being a unique factorization domain. Okay, so what's the big theorem about this? The big theorem about what does this class group look like is that the class group of the ring of integers is always a finite group. Okay, by the way, it's always an abelian group. You're looking at product of ideals in this commutative uh, dedicated domain. So it's going to be a commutative um, group and it's an abelian group. And actually, it's a finite abelian group. Okay, now the proof of this is actually quite wrong, uh, quite long. And it involves something called the geometry of numbers. And that will take a couple of videos to actually explain the proof of this wonderful type of, uh, this wonderful theorem here. What I want to do in the rest of this video instead, though, is I want to talk about how knowledge of this class group, okay? So this contains arithmetic information about this uh, number field and also the ring of integers there. How we can use knowledge of this class group to tell us about arithmetic, okay? And the example that I want to pick is a fairly classical one. It's called Bache's equation. So we're going to look at this equation here. x squared equals y cubed minus d. And so what are the x, y, and the d here? So we're going to solve for x, y, and we want integer solutions for that. The d is going to be a fixed um, uh, uh, positive integer. It's going to be square free. And we're going to insist to make things simpler that d is congruent to 1 modulo 4. Okay, so suppose we fix this d, square free, positive, and it's congruent to 1 modulo 4, and we just want to find all solutions to this equation where x and y, though, are integers. And the funny thing is that this is a question about integers, but the most natural thing to do is to look at the arithmetic of the ring of integers, and in particular use this more fancy version of prime factorization to study this question. Let's see how that works now. Okay, so this is a partial answer to what happens. Okay, there's just a few uh, details that are missing here, and the most important details is about knowledge of this class group. Okay, but other than that, it's going to be pretty um, uh, complete, and uh, it also should hopefully uh, uh, convince you that this class group is an interesting arithmetic object to study. 
Okay, so the idea is we're going to adjoin a, a square root of minus d actually. Okay, so we're going to look in the number field k where we've just adjoined uh, the square root of minus d, so that's i root d to this q. That's a quadratic field extension of q. And if you look at the ring of integers in that, because I've insisted, insisted that this d is congruent to 1 modulo 4, it's just uh, given by uh, the integers plus the uh, integers times i root d. Okay, so it's a little bit easy in this case, and that's rather nice that we have this description of these, um, the ring of integers there. So why do we do that? So uh, we're going to do something similar to what uh, ha happened in Gauss's introduction of Gaussian integers. Okay, we'll put this d to the other side, so you get x cross plus x squared plus d, and then the y cubed here is now equal to x squared plus d. And the point is that in this ring here, we can now factorize it. So we can factorize this as x plus i root d times x minus i root d. Okay, so basically you have a factorization of uh, on uh, of this equation inside this ring of integers. You have this cube here, y cubed, is equal to the product of these two things here. Now normally, if you just work with these and you just pretend everything is integers, you work with uh, prime factorization on both sides. The type of thing that you would like to say is that, um, uh, well, if these are relatively prime, then actually each of these has to be a cube. Okay, so that's what you'd like to do. Uh, and that's the classical type of argument that you'd use uh, uh, when you want to uh, play around with uh, arithmetic and you're using uh, prime factorization. Okay, so that's the like, type of thing that you want to do. Unfortunately, the only type of prime factorization we have is from this theorem here. Okay, so it's a weaker version. Okay, so one thing that you can say though, and this is a bit, I'll leave out some of the details here, is that um, these two, Okay, so there are elements inside this ring of integers. They're relatively prime in that ring of integers. And I won't go through all the details of why that works. Okay, you have to do quite a bit of fiddly sort of like working out. Um, but it's actually not too difficult and it's rather fun. Is that um, this x plus i root d and x minus i root d, they're, they're relatively prime in there. And the basic reason why is that they're not relatively prime in there. Uh, what does that mean? That means that they're both contained in some, some bigger prime. So there's some bigger prime p which contains both x plus i root d and x minus i root d. Okay, so it contains these two. Well, I claim that we're going to get a contradiction, so the rough reason why we get a contradiction is as follows. If you have both of these, well, certainly you have the product, which is y cubed, but this is a prime. A prime is an ideal, so that means that y in particular is inside here as well. Okay, so you should see that y is inside there. Okay, what else can you do? Well, since this is an ideal, you can multiply this by the element i root d is inside the ring. So you can multiply this by i root d and, min, uh, and this by i root d and take the difference. And if you do that, you'll find that 2d also has to be inside this prime ideal. Okay, so that's more information that you have. And the last bit is to see that actually y is an odd number that's relatively prime to d as integers. Now, just looking at integers, and if that's the case, that means that since y is an odd prime, relatively prime to d, you can find some integer linear combination of these uh, numbers so that you'll see that y, this p actually contains 1. Okay, that's the final sort of thing here. And to prove that y is um, uh, odd and also relatively prime to d, you just kind of use this equation. Okay, and you just do a, a parity analysis to show that this is actually y has to be odd. And one of the reasons, for example, that has to be relatively prime to d is that, remember this d is square free. So if there was a prime that divides d and y, it would divide that d exactly once, and it would divide this y at least three times. Okay, so that means that that p divides this right-hand side exactly once, but then p has to divide the left-hand side, and this is a square, so it has to divide at least twice. So that's the reason why actually um, d and y, they have to be relatively prime as integers. Okay, so that basically gives you analysis. It takes a little while to work this out, but the key point is that these two are relatively prime. And now, since uh, these two are relatively prime, and we're talking in terms of as uh, ideals, now we can use the prime factorization that uh, we get of the ideals using the fact that this ring of integers is a Dedekind domain. Okay, let's do the prime factorization. Now we don't have these elements. We're looking now at the ideals. The ideal of y cubed is equal to the ideal 
generated by x plus i root d times the ideal generated by x minus i root d. And we know that these two ideals now are relatively prime. So we can do the previous classic argument before and say that since these are relatively prime, actually, each of these have to be cubes. Each of these ideals are cubes. Okay, so that means that this uh, principal ideal generated by x plus i root d is equal to i cubed for some ideal i. Okay. Now, uh, the, what we really want, of course, is just to say that x plus i root d is a cube of a number. At the moment, all we can say is that the ideal generated by it is a cube of an ideal. Now, we haven't used a class group yet. Okay, and this is the bit where we use a class group. Of course, if the class group, for some reason, is equal to uh, 1, if it's trivial, then of course we can say that i is just a... Um, yeah, the i here is just a principal ideal, and so you can find essentially a cube root of this. Okay. Now we're going to assume something that's uh, actually much um, more general than just the class group being trivial. We're just going to assume that the class group, the order of this, rather, order of the class group, is not divisible by 3. Okay. So we're going to impose a condition on this class group that it, the order of it is not divisible by 3. And if, just, if you're wondering what types, uh, what examples there are, one can show you using the proof of the finiteness of this, okay, um, uh, often we can make it reasonably effective to actually sh uh, bound the size of this. And one, one thing that one can show is that if d equals 5, for example, the class group is actually order 2. Okay, so it's just a cyclic isomorphic to the cyclic group of order 2. In other words, um, up to a principal ideal, um, there's only one non principal ideal. Okay? Okay, so let's suppose that this is the case. So why do we use this? Okay, so let's have a look here. So what's going on here? We've got the fact that i cubed equals this principal ideal. So that means inside the class group, the i cubed, the, 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 the class of i cubed is trivial inside the class group. Okay, so the cube of i is trivial. Okay, but the fact that 3 does not divide the order of this class group, and this is finite, remember, means that there's no 3 torsion in this group. And if there's no 3 torsion in this group, that means that um, i itself must have been uh, giving you the trivial element in the class group. It's 1 inside the class group of OK. And that means that this i itself is principal. Okay, so i is, say, for example, generated by this integer a plus b i root d, a, b being integers. And that's pretty neat. Okay, so this is the key point, okay? Uh, why do we study this class group? How does it help us study integers, okay? In this case, if we can say, in this particular example, uh, we don't need to know everything about this class group, but if we just know that this class group, okay, it has no three torsion because... Um, uh, 3 basically does not divide its order. If we know its order, it's not divisible by 3. And then we know that in this case here, um, you have this, uh, this i is a principal ideal. Okay, so let's go back to this equation here. That means that if you look at the principal ideal uh, generated by a plus b i root d and you cube it, that as an ideal is equal to x plus i root d. And then we can actually do more. So, uh, so what's the next step? Okay, so we made this assumption about the order of the class group. Uh, now we want to move to the level of elements. Okay, let's instead of just looking at the ideal here, we look at that actual element. Okay, so what does it mean that these two ideals are the same? The ideals can only be the same. The principal ideals are going to be the same if and only if the generators differ by a unit. But what are the units in OK cross? Well, since this is an imaginary uh, quadratic field extension, okay, the only units that you have are going to be, and you can see this quite easily from here, um, is going to be, um, so I guess here d doesn't equal 1. d is greater than 1. Let's just make sure we have here d greater than 1 here. So we'll throw away the case where you have a Gaussian integers. So um, here, the uh, units inside here are just plus or minus 1. So either the cube of this number is this x plus i root d, or it's, it's negative. 
Now if it's negative, of course, you can just change the sign of A and B, and the cube of that, when you cube minus 1, okay, gives you the minus sign. So actually, you can take an actual square root, not just of this ideal, but of this element here. So if changing the sign of A and B, if necessary, you can assume that the cube of this element, A plus B, I root D, is actually equal to X plus I root D. And that's pretty neat. And now we're pretty much uh, there for finding a solution. Okay, so what does this mean? Okay, now what do we do is we just uh, look at this equation, and of course you can equate the real and the imaginary parts. Okay, so let's equate the imaginary parts and see what happens. Okay, so what's on the right hand side? On the right hand side, the uh, coefficient of i root d, so a z basis is um, 1 and i root d. Okay, so let's look at the coefficient i root d is 1 here. That's what you have here. And then for this bit here, you can use the binomial theorem to expand. Okay, so there'll be a term uh, involving i root d where you have one of these and the square of that. So you have an a squared, and then you have one of these, so that's a b i root d, so there's a b. And the binomial coefficient is 3 choose a 1, or 3 choose 2, so that's 3 there. And then you also have a cube of this. And if you have a cube of this, so I guess you'll have uh, the cube of the b, b cubed, you might, okay. It'll be an i cubed, which is a minus 1. And if you do root d cubed, you'll get d times root d. So there's a d, and the i root d, of course, comes out. Okay, so that's a coefficient for i root d. So in the end, we have an equation, an integer equation, 1 equals 3a squared b minus b cubed d. Okay, so after all this analysis, we swapped from this equation here, x squared equals y cubed minus d, to this more complicated integer equation, 1 equals 3a squared b minus b cubed d. And I claim that this one's a lot easier to solve. Why is that? Because, well, here there's a common factor of b, so you can pull out the b. Okay, you pull out the b here, and then what you have left over is pull out the b here, you get 3a squared, pull out the b here, you get minus b squared d minus b squared d. And this product of numbers, the nice thing about this is that uh, this product of numbers here, here you have, um, uh, you don't have any small integers to play around with, but this product of numbers has to equal 1. So either you're multiplying two ones or two minus ones. They're the only possibilities for what these two integer factors are. Okay, so b equals plus or minus 1. Once you know that b equals plus or minus 1, the other factor has to also be plus or minus 1. And the other factor is, well, you substitute for b for plus or minus 1, so this b squared is just 1, so you get 3a squared minus d. 3a squared minus d is equal to plus or minus 1. Okay, and so as you can see, now you can solve this. Okay, uh, b equals... Uh, plus or minus 1, 3a squared minus d equals plus or minus 1. So let's do the complete solution. And the only thing that we're missing really, other than some, a little bit of fiddly work here, which is just some uh, very elementary uh, number theory. Okay, the more important sort of uh, assumption here is that we're going to assume that 3 does not divide the order of this class group. If you know that 3 does not uh, in, uh, divide the order of this class group, then it's very easy to work out whether it ha this Bachet's equation has any solutions, and if it has solutions, exactly what they are. Okay, so let's see what it is. So firstly, all you need to do is you need to be able to solve these two. Okay, if you can't solve these two equations, then you're dead in the water. So where do you start with this equation? So basically, you take the second equation, you add d to both sides and divide by 3 to get plus or minus 1 plus d divided by 3. So you just take your d that you start off, that's fixed. You add 1 and subtract 1, and then divide by 3. That'll be two numbers. Okay. And if it's not an integer, you're already dead in the water. Okay. But if it has an integer, you want to see, can it equal an a squared? Is it a square of an integer? If it's a square of an integer, you just pick a, a, a to be a square root. Okay. You pick a to be a square root. Okay. So then you've got a. And this plus or minus 1 will also tell you what b is. Okay, so if it is a square, if it isn't a square, no solutions, and it may be, not be a square because this may not even be an integer. Okay, but if it is a square, you pick your a, and then b is given by whichever choice you had here, plus or minus 1. Okay, and note that the, only one of these can be a, an integer out of the plus or minus. Okay, and most one can be an integer. So it may be that in both cases, you won't get an integer, 
or in both cases you won't get um, a, a square but it could be that one of them will give you a square and once you have that you can actually get back your original solution so how do you do that you basically use this uh, equation here maybe not that equation there Uh, this equation here because now you've got a and b you've got a and b and with this a and b well we equated the imaginary parts that's what solving this means to get you the correct thing here but when you look at the real parts with that given a and b you will end up computing x and of course once you have x okay you can get y and this shows you how studying uh, the class group okay can tell you about integer arithmetic and in this case here the solution to Bache's equation I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics <laughs>